Professor Solomon, that I think you know you used your data to uh, explain. I think we really busted a few myths, at least for some of us sitting here, because we have a general impression, and also watching South Asia closely, there's a typical stereotype narrative that's often unraveling, and you really put that, you know, kind of set correct. So it's really, really thank you, thank you for this absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, uh, summary of your book. Uh, I would like to invite some of your friends and colleagues who are here. Uh, Professor Joseph uh, Keshichan, would you want to come in first? Would you want to? You need to uh, unmute yourself, yes. Well, with pleasure. Uh, in fact, I was typing uh, this, first of all, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. I really learned quite a bit. And uh, what I was typing is that you spoke about democratization in Islam and the compatibility between the two with which I fully agree. I think they're both not only compatible, but essential for them to coexist. But you mentioned nothing about freedom. And I think that this is uh, the key ingredient that is really missing in a lot of Muslim countries, including the monarchies, including the so-called dictatorships, even including the parliamentary governments that we have. What is really missing in the Arab and Muslim worlds today is a measure of freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of thought. I mean, uh, just to give you one simple example, what's happening in Lebanon, one of the most liberal Arab countries, uh, is that you have actually the Speaker of Parliament suing journalists who have criticized them on television. Somehow, the journalists do not have the right to express their opinions on television and cannot really touch them. So my question to you is the following. Can democratization flourish in the Arab and Muslim worlds without a respect, a, a fundamental respect for freedoms? May I respond? Yes, please, please. Okay. Yes. A very, very important point. Um, and you know, living also in Africa, Joseph, um, there is this view of um, kind of illiberal democracy going back to Farid Zakaria. Uh, so um, w without having those freedoms. And I think, you know, um, the, um, various um, Islamists have pushed this agenda that uh, the role is to prevent people from doing wrong. You know, that's the purpose of the state. It's, it's sort of negative freedom. And the point that I made, uh, and indeed in my book, I do deal with the issue, and I, I, and I quote how badly the Muslim world is doing if you look at the Freedom House Index. Uh, no, you can't have democracy without freedom. Um, but I think that if, uh, if you look at the issue of... Um, uh, if you look at the distinction between fiqh and, and siyasa that I was talking about, and if you talk about leaving certain things for the individual conscience and for the state to focus on the public good, building that road, getting kids to school and those kinds of stuff, as opposed to what people are doing inside their homes, whether or not they are having alcohol or whatever, I think that's the way to go, leaving it to your individual conscience. Um, but, but, but your point also raises a very interesting point, uh, and, and I say this as an academic. You know, if you look at us, and sorry, I did not mention this, but there's a big part of the book dealing with economic indicators. Uh, there was the 2017-2018 Arab Opinion Index, and only 1.39, 1.39% of respondents viewed the economic conditions positively in their countries, Arab, in their Arab countries. And, and, and here's the point. How do you have economic innovation without having freedom of thought at that level as well? And increasingly, it seems to me that many Arab countries want to follow maybe the Chinese example of controlling the political process and then having economic growth. And there's all kinds of tensions with that. And, I, and I'm not in favor of that. And I don't think that you can be economically innovative also. So when I, when I look at freedom, it's all encompassing. It, it, it is not just um, 
uh, freedom to have alcohol or and, and, and things like that. But it is also about freedom in, in terms of economic freedom as well. Uh, very, very, very important. And, um, and in, in terms of the uh, not controlling academic institutions to push a certain line and, and so forth. So no, you cannot decouple democracy from freedom. Thank you. Um, Professor Ramakrishnan, would you want to say something? Hello, I'm, I'm fine. I enjoyed uh, Hussein Solomon's lecture. Thanks, Hussein. No question. All right, okay. okay. Um, I can, um, Professor Tanaka? Would you want to unmute yourself, Professor Tanaka? Sorry, thank you for this opportunity and thank you, Professor Solomon, for your wonderful lecture tonight. Um, since uh, Professor Kasheshian was talking about uh, freedom, one point that, I, uh, that came to my mind was uh, whether you consider the economic liberalization of a state essential to the democratization uh, process of Arab and Muslim states. Because uh, in countries like Iran and several other uh, surrounding uh, entities, there are the state entities or state, uh, say, institutions that hold a significant part of the economic activities. Now, if that is the case, and if that is to continue, how would you see the future of this uh, democratizing uh, or the possibility of the democratization in that sort of a state? Thank mm. you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's related to my response uh, um, to the earlier question by Joseph. And no, uh, I think that economic liberalization, political liberalization is a part and parcel of it. And you know, part of the problem is, and, and again, to get back to this notion of the Chinese model, where you have the state sort of leading, uh, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of it. And especially in terms of the MENA countries, where corruption is so rife, the state is actually so incompetent, and you have to make space for this family member, or this prince, or whatever, where people are appointed on the basis of, 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 of who they know as opposed to what they know. Um, you are not going to have economic growth. And indeed, I should also maybe say to you that this book that was published with Anu um, is actually only the first volume of something larger, uh, which is a, a book coming out next year, also from Springer, focusing on these issues. And no, you cannot have economic liberalization uh, with state control, especially given also the kind of rentier economies in the region and so forth. Uh, so, so they need to open up the process. But this means that the regimes will have to actually de facto commit political suicide. And I'm not sure if they are prepared to do that. Thank you for your answer. Yes, I totally agree with you. Professor Dieter, would you want to come in? Professor Gulshan Dieter. Can you, I, I'm not able to spot her just now. Yeah, I think I'm uh, audible now. Yeah. Hussein uh, Solomon, so nice to see you after a long, long, long time. You started your talk by referring to is recognition of Israel by a couple of Arab states. And then you were sort of digging down and bringing out other factors. Would you relate to them now? How would you relate the Arab recognition of Israel from the rest of your talk? Um, well, first and foremost, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining this talk. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure to have met you. I, I recall visiting your home with Professor 
Kumar Swami many, many years ago. And it's a pity that I have not been able to uh, link up with you on one of my visits, but certainly it is my intention. Um, no, I was actually starting my talk saying what I'm not doing. What I'm not doing is, is now talking about, of course, it's all the rage to talk about the UAE and Bahrain and so on, because I wanted to talk about ordinary people's attitudes. And I think that the shift in ordinary people's attitude um, also facilitated facilitated um, what happened because it gave the regimes a certain wiggle room to do what they what they could do. As to the deal itself, as I, as I alluded to, I think that a lot has to do with Iran. It has a lot to do um, in terms of Trump wanting to leave the region. Uh, uh, I think it was yesterday that Professor Kumar Swami's institute put out something by Alon Ben Meir saying that this Israeli-Arab alliance was, uh, was now coming for some time. One of the dangers, let me, without trying to throw cold water onto the deal itself, one of the dangers, though, is uh, that to get back to the main point, which was on issues of political democratization and freedom, if it doesn't enhance these regimes' repressive capabilities, repressive capabilities, now you're asking them or you are talking about them wanting to get uh, new arms supplies. So what is it? If 35 so from the Americans and so forth. And I think that while, while this deal is good and positive, I think that issues of broader democratization and so on must also be uh, um, uh, pushed through because from the various opinion surveys that I quote here, the Arab street is not happy with their government. So leave aside the issue of Shia versus Sunni, Iran versus Saudi Arabia and so on the issue of freedom is not looking good in the Arab world. And, and especially where the youth is, you know, and I think that given the deal uh, between Israel and the Arab countries, these countries shouldn't be given a free pass. In other words, their, their um, internal policies, their lack of freedom and so on should still be critiqued by the international community. Thank you. Thank you so so much. Ambassador Singh, would you want to come in? You need to unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, talk, and uh, it was a pleasure listening to you. I have a theoretical question, and the theoretical question being as follows. What is Islam's advice to the individual about relationship with the temporal authority? Would it be proper for him or her to challenge it? And the state's role in directing sermons in the mosque and the ulemas. Is there a contradiction there to democratization? Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think let me deal with your, with your second point. When I spoke, I, I, I quoted the theorist um, Stepan and Linz, and they spoke about the twin tolerations. I know that across the Middle East region, there are many um, uh, khutbahs, sermons, and so forth, which is written and given to the local imam. And in my view, the political uh, shouldn't uh, mingle with these kinds of things. It shouldn't. Um, so there should be latitude by the imam to come up with, he, with his or, uh, or her, should I say, sermon. Um, having said that, um, I, I think that the, the Islamists put a certain perspective out in terms of the relationship with this idea that Islam is state and religion. Uh, but in my view, I actually argue for the separation between it, that it's not. And I do quote various um, political thinkers. Um, I mean, even in Iran, in my book, I, I, I forget the imam, um, 
but there are Muslim clerics which actually argue that politics is fundamentally dirty. And if you throw religion into the equation, then you sully it, okay? Where, where um, religion serves certain temporal purposes. And even if you go to Indonesia, and if you look at this great Muslim thinker, Nucholish, he also argued along those lines. So, um, and if you read, of course, Karen Armstrong's books, you know, her various books, you know, uh, and, and, she, and she quotes the Quran, that the prophet came as a, a warner, okay, uh, etc. So I think an argument can be made uh, for the separation. Also, if you read people like uh, Khalid Abdul Al-Fadl's books on Islam, he also says that you need to read the Quran also in terms of the, the current circumstances, okay? Various religious books were not okay with uh, now slavery, okay? Um, but it's not okay to be Muslim or Christian or Jewish and say it's fine to, to, for you to keep slaves. So, so we need to keep the spirit of the faith, but also adapt to the current norms and so forth. I can see a question by Mudassir. Mudassir, why don't you ask yourself? Thanks. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot, Professor Solomon. I think that was a fascinating uh, talk. And, uh, you know, I completely agree with some, most of your, uh, you know, points which you have raised, especially, uh, I mean, quite, I'm uh, quite excited actually about, uh, you know, how uh, you ended up on a very optimist, no uh, you know, optimist note, especially in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how the society is reacting to changes and, uh, you know, uh, how religion is being seen as just one uh, part of, you know, social life. Uh, I, I thought, you know, I was re recently reading Ahmed Kuru's uh, book on, Islam, authoritarianism, and underdevelopment, and he, he has brought out some historical, you know, comparative ideas. And one of the things which stuck me, and that is his primary uh, hypothesis also, is that it is between 11th and 12th century that in Muslim societies there there, there was an alliance of ulema and mili military that mm -hmm. started to come up that actually sidelined the alliance of uh, intellectuals and uh, businessmen which 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 kind of gradually led to the decline of uh, these societies and also led to a rise of authoritarianism or you know, uh, you know lack of freedom in these societies so i thought maybe perhaps you can react to some whatever you know all these this hypothesis mm -hmm. and your views on that mm -hmm. thank you Thank you. It's, it is a fascinating question, and I actually do deal with it in terms of the book. Um, as you know, there are, if you go to back to the 1970s, there were democratic theorists like Barrington Moore, who uh, pushed forth the notion that you cannot have uh, democratization without a middle class. Okay? And I think that is in keeping with Akuru's argument. Now, one of the most interesting things about the Muslim world is that it consists of, uh, Muslims consist of 22% of the world's population, 22% of the world's population, but they have less than 5% of the world's GDP. And outside of the oil-rich countries, and there's all kinds of challenges around these oil-rich countries, as you know, um, in terms of oil prices, in terms of shale gas, in terms of the future of hydrocarbons technologically and so on. But outside of that, the, um, the Muslim world consists of a patchwork of poor countries. And these poor countries, if you look at the work done by the economist Eric Weed, uh, actually produce dictatorships. Uh, and it's true of, uh, of, uh, of the Middle East, it's true of Africa, it's true of Latin America. It lends itself to military strongmen and so on. 
So outside of Islam, and to go back what, to, to what Dr. Data said at the, at the beginning, outside of the faith, there are all of these structural conditions which needs to be happen. And this is why I was also in favor of what um, uh, Professor Tanaka mentioned earlier about economic liberalization. You need to grow it. You need to grow an independent middle class with strong political values of democracy, of freedom, of accountability, and so forth. Otherwise, you know, any opening is going to be a mirage in a desert, forgive the pun on that one. And so you need to actually focus in terms of the economy. And as you all know, one of the reasons for the growth of these Islamist groupings in the region and also in Africa is the fact that they open up schools that they open up rudimentary health clinics, that they, that, that they actually do what the social contract is supposed to do, where a state is supposed to promote the welfare of its citizens. And then you have the transfer of loyalty from the state to these various Islamist groupings, okay? Which then results in, in, your, in, your, in, in your military dictatorships, your political repression and so forth. And so the issue of economic growth is actually central if we want to see a more stable Middle East. But to be honest with you, none of the things that I see in terms of the Middle East, all the positive measures, in, in including your vision 2030 and so forth, seems to me has the necessary vision. Uh, because as I said, people will have to give up their uh, neo-patrimonial and your, uh, um, networks there and, uh, and so forth, and I'm and I'm not sure if the the political leaders are willing to sacrifice themselves and their families for their citizens. Um, I could see a hand by Rachit. Rachit, do you want to come in now? Hello, sir. Hmm. Hello. Sir, I have a, just two brief questions. Sir. Like you have mentioned many surveys in your book like 70 percent of iranians they don't think they are muslims and all my point is uh, how far these surveys are reliable like had it been some objective survey like safety of women some there are some parameters so you can have the objectivity but these are purely opinion based and this era of say social media like how steady these are this like opinions are like will they hold to their opinion for a longer period like because today in a survey if they say something Tomorrow, propaganda video comes or in social media, they see something and they might change the opinion. And like the way you are saying that uh, Erdogan and Ayatollahs are out of line when it comes to their population. But we are not seeing any such uprising, neither in Iran, neither in Turkey. A small uprisings are there, here and there. And second question is sir, like about economic liberalization. Like where do you feature Singapore? It's an economic liberalization country in all economic glitterati. We just forget this political suppression there. So like this, like my point is how far perception is important for the debate around democracy. Because we never talk about democracy of Singapore. Rarely there are deb debates of democracy of Singapore. In, and at some point they even defend the Singapore model also, which is not at all democratic. So like how far perception is important for debates around democracy. So that's all. Awesome. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, two very good questions. Let me deal with the issue of surveys. Um, you know, if you visit the region, you know, I started visiting the region in the 1990s and um, interacting with people from the region, especially young people, there's been a sea change. Now, of course, there's your margin of error, what you ask yourself, how representative were the samples, is it just the rural areas and, and, or, or the urban areas and so on? And this is why I used a variety of different surveys here. Um, those coming from the region and those coming from elsewhere to uh, try to get a feel of, of this. Uh, but in terms of like, for example, specifically um, when, I, when I gave you the statistics which just came out about Iran in terms of uh, uh, the, the number of people who don't identify themselves as Muslim and so on. You also have to admit that only a tiny uh, percentage of any population is any involved in any revolution per se. Okay, and this is what was now true of the 1979 I I Iranian revolution. 
if you look at photographs from that time and so on, you, you can see how secular it was. In some cases, it was enforced secularism, like on the model of, of now, of the Ataturk in Turkey. And of course, then you have a blowback. But there were uprisings, and, but there's also the repression of the state. And we need to ask ourselves a very important question. Why do certain ideas catch on and other ideas don't catch on? And in chapter two of the book, I also look at why the whole Protestant Reformation in Europe was so successful. And the reason it was successful was that the various kings in Europe wanted to be uh, having greater independence from the Pope. And so what they did was they, ac they actually protected dissidents like Martin Luther. They protected them. And that not because of any religious reasons, but for political reasons, because they wanted greater independence. The problem is, you know, um, I have friends of mine, for example, in Bangladesh. And if you look at the number of, of, of secular Muslim thinkers who are being killed or being forced out of the country. So ideas don't catch on. And the reason why, I mean, there was just recently protests in terms of Iran. Okay, um, uh, you can go back to the Green Revolution in terms of 2009 and, and so forth, but there is a lot of repression, uh, also in terms of Turkey as well. And, and, and uh, I mean, if you look at the number of journalists uh, jailed, academics losing their posts and so forth. The issue of economic liberalization, to be frank, I haven't followed, um, and I wasn't talking about Singapore. I was talking about the MENA region, and I don't know much about Singapore. But what I will narrate to you is a story. When I visited um, Saudi Arabia, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, I think it was 2008, um, came there with a delegation to assist the Saudis in terms of getting their economy right-sized. And I happened to meet a member of the delegation who was having supper. Uh, and he was sitting at the next table, and I decided just to start a conversation with him, only to find out that the visit is cut short and they're going to be leaving. And the reason they were leaving was because uh, the delegation from Singapore suggested that you shouldn't put so many princes in various positions, that people should be based on merit, <laughs> which the Saudis found problematic. So that was my one experience in terms of, 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 the, uh, of the Singaporean model in Saudi Arabia, and, and, and hence my cynicism about economic liberalization as well as political liberalization in the MENA region. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to invite Dr. Stemet from University, same university as you are. Dr. Stemet, yes. Fascinating talk. I'd like to bring it back maybe to the immediate. We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? A bit louder, if possible. There you go. Can you hear me now? I really can't, but can the others? Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Okay, I don't want, if, if the panel can't hear, I'm not going to pose the question. I don't want to waste time. Can I continue? Yes, please, please. Okay, right. So, uh, wonderful talks. Thank you. I'd like to bring it back to the immediate. You know, um, terms like... Um, the terms you use, uh, democracy, identity, etc. Now, reform is one thing, but when we put this together, identity, politics, culture, economics, and also religion, I think we're talking about an evolution. And now, the possibility of a social evolution, you can use a different word for social, is dependent on so many things. And one of them is, of course, fear. Now, in a post-COVID-19 global status quo, will that status quo not undoubtedly exacerbate an inward-looking rediscovery 
of national identity and defense of the own, and also the, you know, the, 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 the safety of the past. How do you see this um, eluding and, and uh, impacting on democratic evolution? Because doesn't fear, or won't fear make great inroads and rather have a sort of conservative backlash, if you follow me? I, I don't know if I'm clear, but how do you see this international crisis that's, uh, that the world is in impacting on the developments in the regions that you refer to or not? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stemmet. Um, uh, I recently, earlier this year, published a piece uh, with the Jerusalem Center for uh, Public Affairs focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on the region. But, but let me deal with a few issues. Um, identity politics looms really large in the region, as you know. It's not, I'm not just simply talking about Shia and Sunni. I'm talking about clan politics uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and of course, where Joseph is in terms of Lebanon, you see the sectarian system also coming under fire and, and so on. And politicians make use of this, of this fear the fear of the proverbial other, the fear of the foreigner, the fear indeed of losing one's culture and one's identity and so on. And that all contributes to an inward looking thing. Um, and the problem, of, of course, the issue is that when one is dealing with a greater fear, so for example, you can be pushing a, an anti-Semitic line all of your political life, but now when faced with the existential threat in terms of Iran, you now have to change tack very quickly and say that my, that my, that my enemy's enemy is my friend. <laughs> um, so, so now all of these is now conditioned on certain realities. Um, also, when, when you may want to be more nationalistic, more inward looking, but there's the forces of economic globalization. I mean, you need to sell your uh, oil elsewhere. You, would, you need certain goods. You need certain technologies. Okay. And that also forces you to open up. The issue of COVID-19, COVID-19 actually exacerbated all kinds of tensions in the region along identity lines and so forth. But it also opened up certain governments for criticism. So for example, um, uh, everyone is aware of of, of a particular country's faltering health system. But when you have a sudden crisis and when people are dying and they can't get hospital treatment and you don't have ventilators or you don't have enough beds on, on a medication, suddenly, you know, the emperor is proved to be naked and the contradictions becomes that more obvious. And inside regimes, you have people fighting as well you know, uh, as they realize it. So COVID-19 exacerbated many of the trends that we saw in the region and just confirmed that certain things weren't working in terms of the ordinary people. Thank you. Um, this has been perfectly timed and I'm going to, you know, now hand over to Kumar because it's five o'clock now, but I just want to say and I speak for everyone here. This is absolutely fascinating, Professor Solomon. It was such a pleasure to hear you and, you know, understand this region through your eyes. Um.